Hey everyone, my name is Patrick. Thank you so much for joining us for the Undignified Podcast, where we talk about worship, the church, and everything else. Thank you so much for joining me. As you can see, I am not in my office. I'm in a new apartment that my family and I just moved into, which is why you hear all of these construction noises. It's a story for another day. What I really want to talk to you about is the fact that I just got to have a conversation with Eric Marshall. Now you hear the name Eric Marshall and you think, who is that? But you may have heard of Young Oceans, which is a music project that you might classify as worship music. And I know I did, but Eric and Young Oceans would call what they do something different, which we'll get into in a little bit. But Eric is someone who I've worked with on a church staff for many years together. We now work in two different states and do different things, but he's a good friend. I'm, I'm really thrilled that I get to call him a friend. I'm thrilled that we got to have this conversation together. And I think that a lot of the things he shares today are going to challenge you, are going to make you think a little bit, encourage you, make you laugh. Let's get into it. Uh, this is my conversation with Young Oceans or Eric Marshall. Welcome everybody to the Undignified Podcast. I am here with my good friend that I actually have not seen in a really long time. I'm here with uh, Eric Marshall. How are you doing, man? Good, man. Thanks for having me on. It, I, I know we kind of like caught up a few minutes ago, family, where we're at, all that kind of stuff. But for everybody, you know, for the dozens, for the dozen of people that's listening to this or watching this, can you give us just like the quick, like, where are you at? What are you doing? Like, what are you passionate about? What are you working on? Like, what's, what, what does life look like for you right now? Uh, yeah, man. Uh, well, of course, you know, we know each other from our New York time. And I've been out of New York now for five years, which is hard to believe. I still can't really accept that I don't live in New York anymore, but making the most of it. Living in East Nashville, which uh, I've come to really, really love. It's been really good for my family, my three kids and my wife and I. And um, my days are spent mostly doing what I've always been doing, which is um, writing what I call prayer music and recording i record a lot in my little space right here that i'm in right now and um i still help out with some some old friends in new york at another church up there on another project um doing much of the same stuff and um once in a while i find myself um saying yes to some live stuff to some concerts or guest leading somewhere um but i try to stay home as much as possible because i'm um afraid of going out into the world <laughs> That's so funny. I, um, you, you, you have, or you are one of my favorite music projects ever, uh, Young Oceans, which uh, has written, I would say to, to use like one word, kind of like countercultural worship or church music, uh, that has like blessed a ton of people. And I have to say, since you moved, uh, from New York, uh, to Nashville, um, you've continued to grow that project and you can talk more about that, but multiple times I've met someone who's like in the worship world or I'm leading with someone and they've said like, Hey, how about we do this song? Or I'm saying like, how about we do this song, uh, uh from, um, young oceans. And I'll say, well, well, I, I, you know, I, I know this guy and they'll look at me and they'll say, you, you know, young oceans. And my response is all, my response is always, do you mean Eric? Yeah, I know. Or I think I've heard, I've, do you know the Young Oceans? So like my 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 first question for you is, you already mentioned your studio. A, a week or so ago, I had a, a conversation with David Gunger from The Brilliance, Brilliance, and he said most of his music, he's he's doing way less live stuff, and he's transitioned more to a studio uh, project. Would you say the same is true for you? You know, my day-to-day for 10 years or 11 years, you know, with, with you at, at our old church, um, in New York was, was that it was, it was every Sunday, you know, we were, we were leading often multiple parishes, you know, leading music. And so I've, that ha not, the music is awesome in your, in your background there, by the way, I love that. <laughs> we have to address this. I'm, I'm upstairs in my church office. So Downstairs is a children's sing-along group. Uh, uh, just partying emphatically. So much is going right with this interview so far. I love it. Anyway, continue. It's perfect. It's perfect. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, not having not having the week to week uh, every Sunday experience was definitely jarring for me when I first um, left New York. Um, I would still be leading about once a month, like um, at at a, at random places, and I assumed I assumed that I would be kind of find myself probably um, a, after a year or so of being here um, in a full time worship leading like position. I, that's something I kind of desired, but I just wanted a little break. Um, so right about the time that I thought that I'd be, you know, um, transitioning to something like that. Um, is when COVID got crazy and COVID came along and there was just no, there was no one meeting. So it's been really weird. Like I think had it not been for COVID, I probably would have like, like gone back to a more regular rhythm of leading somewhere, whether it was my job or not, wasn't really the point, but just, I just, you know, I really did miss it. So I've kind of, I still feel like I've been in like a strange limbo now, even, like I said, five years in, um, I'm just kind of like, I've like a lot of artists, I, after taking so much time where we just had to be at home, um, it's just harder and harder for me to, to like go out and travel right now. I just feel, it just feels so arduous for some reason. So part of that is probably just the COVID, COVID-ness. That was not a, like necessarily a choice in my, you know, my arc or my, career or whatever you want to call it um but that being said i'm um i've always been much more drawn to studio studio work and to writing um and and recording than i have to like seeking out live events so i hear that i the i I, you already kind of mentioned the transition you know going from uh you know where you were in new york i mean we would have uh you know as you mentioned we work together uh, in New York at a church, um, at a pretty big church. And, you know, every single week, you know, we started to work and correct, correct me if I'm remembering the story differently than you do, but we would work super close, a lot of planning, a lot of like vision for like worship and stuff. And then as the church grew, we kind of separated into not like silos where we were completely separate, but like it was more like you were at one location and I was at another location. And like you said, it was really hands on. What's been like you said that was a bit of a challenge or definitely a transition. But what's been like some of the biggest things that stand out between I'm essentially full time every Sunday and then throughout the week working at a church to now I'm in a studio writing beyond the obvious. Like what have been some of like the tangible or intangible differences that you kind of noticed uh, between those two roles? Um, well, I, I always make reference to this because and this definitely is going to age me. But do you remember that old Chevy Chase movie, Funny Farm? You ever see that? I haven't seen it like, you know, since I was a kid, but. So it's the it's the story of this of this um, of this aspiring novelist who's got like a he's got a full time job in the city doing something that he doesn't love, and he decides to make the big move and quit the job and move to the country so he can write the great American novel. And of course, he moves and they and 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 he can't write a thing. He's completely blocked, you know. And and that's the story is that like um, of just just how hilarious that can be. You have these desires to go, you know, do the Walden thing and and you know seclude yourself and and come up with some brilliant art. Um, so honestly, the first thing that I noticed because I came here as a choice, a risk that I was going to pursue. Um, I was going to try to be really prolific and really focus more on young oceans in, in particular. <laughs> For the first year, I was no more productive down here than I had been having a full-time worship leading job in New York. I didn't write any more songs. I didn't record any more. Um, part of that was just because you find yourself, you're sort of staring off into the clouds and there's all this pressure of writing something brilliant, um, which is a classic, a classic like um, fallacy of trying to be creative is... Um, you just have to sit down and do the work. You know what I mean? It's, it, you're not going to get struck by some inspirational lightning just because you made some time, you know, um, you have to keep doing the work. So that's the first thing I learned is like, oh, wow. Um, I'm, I'm definitely prone to much more laziness than I, than I even knew. Um, 
and so so it, it kind of woke me up and and i realized i actually need to be doing um some things some other freelance things as a way to kind of like counterbalance my constant desire to want to be prolific and and to be and to be writing so i took I took some job out of necessity because I needed the money. I took some jobs playing for other artists. I, I it was a really cool experience. I got to tour with another artist as like a side player. Um, and that like, it wasn't my music. And so there was some challenge to that. I'd never been like a side person before and it was kind of humbling. Um, but it really made me want to keep, you know, like keep the other side of my stuff going. Um, so I found that to be true across, across my life. Like, if I'm only doing songwriting, um, I tend to I tend to get kind of not just bored, but like uh, uninspired. Um, and so, if I find it having we have a little house down here in Nashville, and, and I will I will force myself to like take on projects that I know are going to be arduous, you know. But, you know, like I just got f- finished. My wife and I just like refinished our kitchen. We did most of the work ourselves which is a dumb thing to do and it takes forever. But after a month of doing that, I, I was like, man, I'm, I cannot wait to get back into the studio and, and begin writing. So like, for me, it's always that back and forth. You got to do real life and then you have to do your kind of prayer life. Um, but you can't just do, you can't just do one. You have to be doing both, you know? That's, that's really interesting because I feel like there is this feeling. I knew, I know that when I was a young worship leader, I wanted to be, the cool worship leader that worked for myself was on like some worship tour. I mean, this is all young stuff and there's a lot to say about that market. There's a lot to say about that uh, dream. There's a lot to say about that role. Uh, Just like you could say a lot about anything. Right. Um, But it's so funny because I like what I'm hearing you say is, is kind of counter to that. The grass is always greener thing. You know, you, you took the risk, you, you made a jump and you're like, yes, I am my own boss. But then, as you said, you kind of realized maybe I still need some of that other mundaneness to kind of like ground me and help me be grateful for what I have. Like, is that kind of what you're saying? Is that similar? Are we on the same page? That's exactly what I'm saying. And, 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 and I used to say this as when I was full-time worship leading, well, full-time, full-time meaning like I was every Sunday but, you know, as you know, our, our bosses and our leaders that we work with very much valued all of us doing these creative things on this, you know, on this, on the side, <laughs> whatever. Um, and um, I used to say to people back then, and now I've kind of put my foot in my mouth, like, no one should be writing worship music unless they're leading worship on the regular, you know. Um, and I still think that there's something to that. Like, I, I don't think if you... I, and I still lead. Like I just guest led for a friend of mine in town a couple of weeks ago. I'm, I, I end up doing worship leading about once a month, and I'm so thankful every time I do it because it's like it's like a lawyer. You know, a lawyer is practicing law, and he, you know, he often he or she will have to every year go take a class, or every two or three years get recertified. You know, or if you're in medicine, you're practicing medicine. Like I think for people that are leading prayer music, like you have to be you have to be constantly honing and learning and um, adjusting. Like you don't just arrive, you know? So I'm thankful for that. Now, I, I, I love everything you just said. And there's like, there's like several things I want to jump off on. But the first thing I want to say is I know you, you're one, you're, you're one of the most intentional people I know. Um, let me give you a small example. Uh, when you started basically getting serious at some point in your, I play rock music in New York career before we even worked together. We just knew each other. You, Mm -hmm. you said, I'm going to start producing my own audio. You bought logic pro. I'm going somewhere with this before you used logic. Tell me if I'm wrong. A friend of mine looked at me and said, did you know he read the manual twice? Is that true? (laughs) I don't remember doing that, but that, that's usually what I do. Yeah. Okay. That's so okay. Man, you have an amazing memory. I definitely remember. Like, it's so funny now because logic, I logic is so cheap now. <laughs> At the time, yes. it wasn't. I think it was like five hundred bucks. 
yeah. which felt like a mortgage payment, you know what I mean? And, and it was, you know, the DVDs or whatever and, um, CD ROMs and, um, no, I usually will read a manual cover to cover when I get a new piece of gear. Um, well, well, that, and- that's my point. You're, you're, you're so intentional. Um, and yes, you're right. Logic used to come in this huge box. It wasn't just a download, whatever. Mm-hmm. You've said something twice, maybe three times in our conversation already that I've never heard you say before. And I think you're saying it with intentionality. Why do you continue to say prayer, anyone doing prayer music? <laughs> that's, that's what I call what I do. Um, and I have a, I do have some very specific reasons for that. Um, I've, I've, I've felt that I've seen a pattern over the last 10, 15, 20 years. Um, I mean, anyone that, that grew up, um, even, even slightly around what, what's called the CCM phenomenon, you know, the contemporary Christian contemporary music, is it, conte- which is first contemporary? I don't know. CCM, we, we all know what it is. Um, you know, back in the eighties, late seventies, eighties, it was this beautiful revolutionary thing. It was a kind of like, well, why, why shouldn't we be doing, you know, Jesus music in the same kind of like, you know, musical housings as all this other stuff that, you know, the kids are enjoying, you know? And so, and so basically Nashville was, was, you know, out of the country world in Nashville came the, Christian music world and the CCM world. And it became this, this huge world, like first national and then worldwide phenomenon. Um, something we now call Christian music. Um, I have a lot to say about that. Um, but that's not really your question. And from there, um, I think I I don't formally study this stuff, but this is just kind of like my guess is along the way, you know, out of the seeker um, mega church movement began to grow these these gigantic um, worship hubs. You know, I, obviously Hillsong being one of the first, um, Bethel and Jesus Culture a little bit after that, and now there's dozens and dozens of these these conglomerates, these churches which are massive to begin with. You're talking, you know. 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people that are attending a network of, of churches, um, sometimes spread across cities. Um, and, and now you turn on CCM radio, it used to be just message music, you know, the, the classic tagline of, of, um, was it K-Love is, you know, positive and encouraging, you know, my, my local radio station in Florida said, uh, safe for the little ears safe for the little ears, which is like, yeah, beautiful. Why not? You know, like there's a time when that's, when that's really going to like, like serve a a great purpose for families, you know? Um, But at some point, I think around the passion Tomlin time, um, we have to remember that there was no worship music, you know, well, it wasn't necessarily worship music first and foremost that was on the radio. It was message music. Um, and that has shifted now. Like you'll go, if, if you, if you were to dare to turn on Christian, Christian radio, FM radio in any town, you'd hear a Lauren Daigle song. And then you'd hear, um, you know, a passion song or, or a Bethel song. And, and, there is no there is no differentiation now between message music and worship music at least on fm radio and and what what's also happened in people's minds is christian music has has now been a had been kind of like the main heading over all that stuff. well it's just christian music you know like and i've kind of along the way began to ask myself like well, what the heck does any of that mean anymore you know like um, in the same way that, you know, you used to have three genres, you know, like <laughs> classical music, jazz, and this new thing called rock, the kids are calling rock and roll, you know, um, out of there grew all these subgenres. And it, it, as you know, now, you know, you can go on Spotify, there's 
there's almost an endless amount of subgenres, and I think that's a good thing. Like, there's a difference. I think you you would probably know the difference between indie rock and indie pop, or the difference between indie pop and bedroom pop, um, you know, or alt rock and hard rock. You know, like those things kind of matter. Um, and what I really, really um, am bothered by in Christian space, again, quotes, um, is that everything gets funneled under this category of worship music now. Um, and I just think that that's an error because, because um, when my template is, has always been, and really all of, all of like Christendom's music template has always been the Psalms, whether they know it or not. And no, nothing has been said in the last 10 20 30 40 years that hasn't already been said by david or asaf or moses and um and when i look at the psalms i see lots of different types of of um expressions and poetry and it's not always worship um it's not always adoration unto the lord many times you'll 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 read david's writings and it's it's nothing more than a journal entry you know a personal musing uh, a a diary entry or or a, we all know you know that that there's really more laments in the psalms than there are you know expressions of praise or adoration unto god so like but what they all definitely are for me, and this is where I come up with this category, they're all definitely prayers, you know? And so what I do with Young Oceans, like, uh, I think our first record probably could have first of, like, like on the whole probably been called a worship record. But I just, like, after that, I started to realize, like, I have this con these, con these true and honest conversations with God in my personal, you know, quietness. And those are the things I feel compelled to, to put into song. That's how I feel connected to the Lord. Um, and I'm, I'm going to do that. But I, I'm just finding that these old headings aren't really going to make sense for what I'm doing. So I, I try to spread the gospel of the term prayer music, hopefully to liberate people and hopefully to expand some of our language, because I think we've been a bit limited for the last 10, 20 years. Eric, I, I have always, um, conversations with you are always extremely intriguing, sometimes very frustrating, but always intentional. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, you know, you and I worked together, like I said, pretty closely. And there was moments where I was just looking at you and I could see your brain and your heart outside of your body. And this thing, like this thing you would do, like kind of, uh, you weren't being coy about it, but you were like, well, prayer music, just dropping that little nugget. I just so happened to pick it up. And I, and, and, and one, if, if you catch me on the wrong day, I'm just like, okay, what's prayer music? But then your heart yeah. and your brain, it's like come out of your body and you go, well, let me tell you in five minutes why I say that. And it is that, that was so everything you said was a fact and it was ex so extremely concise that now I want to call everything prayer music, <laughs> but that means we have to have a prayer life. We have to be in the secret place. That's, that's, <laughs> so it's, so it's like, it's like convicting, but also just like, no, like factually true. But, and, and I thank you so much for sharing that. That really, yeah, that really, that really touched my heart. And I, I do want, I know you said you had a lot to say just about, the industry itself and whatever could you take a couple minutes and just kind of expand on that a little bit don't say anything you don't want to but you do have a unique perspective of someone who's been full-time in the church may started a creative prayer music project while working at a church if i remember correctly and now this this machine that you are closely not tied to but 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 rub up against more than I do. You've got some thoughts on it. Do you want to take a couple minutes and just uh, share some of them? Yeah, I mean, it's funny be for me because um, this is when I had to be really careful not to be 
um, not to be critical in, in like a hurtful sense. Um, like I think we can all, we can all work to be critical in a objective sense, you know, and we, we should, we should have thoughts and we should process our thoughts about things in culture, but yeah. Um, you know, I, I I'm in, I'm, I'm always in some kind of like some part of this process of, of trying to decipher what, like what is happening here um and it's weird for me because um i'm obviously benefiting from many of the structures of this machine you know like um ccli which which you know i used to hate doing those reports at when i was a a week to weeks i used to get calls from the people at ccli you haven't done your report in three months you know I actually once went on like a, a bender where I like did all this research to discover, to try to discover if CCLI was like even like legit or if it was just a scam, you know, there's some lawyers that actually believe that it's not legitimate and that there's no, that, that you don't actually need a license. But anyway, we'll get cut, to that later. Uh, cut, cut to Eric. Once again, logic manual two times. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's just a little fishy is all. Um, and um you know i i know that i know that like you can't do like a you can't do a conversation about jesus and culture without talking about bono so here we go but he's got this he's got a line in in one of the songs on um the old album pop which came out in 1997 and he talks about when you when you put Jesus in show business, essentially everything goes to crap, you know, um, the, your art suffers in some sense when you try to monetize Jesus, but more importantly, I think, um, what Jesus says, you know, the idea of worshiping in, in spirit and truth, I think is somewhat diminished when you monetize, try to monetize his, his way, his message, you know, which is uh, in the way, the truth and life. I just, you know, I remember hearing one time back when we were in, we were uh, at Trinity Grace and, and I, someone said to me, it was actually Tyson. He said he had, he, it was like telephone, but he had heard an interview with one of the um with one of the pastors i believe at either bethel or jesus culture i'm not sure which one i think it was bethel and someone had declared in a moment of kind of glee and 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 um and excitement that they believe at their church and in their music program that they have discovered that is to say sort of pulled down the sound of heaven you remember that? Remember that being said? Okay, so I, I'm not I'm not like mis- misguided that I, I remember that. No, I, I I full I fully remember I, I remember this exact moment. Yeah. And I like just had like a really strong visceral negative reaction to that idea. I was really really upset about that. Um. <clears throat> I had someone tell me this uh, about a meme the other day. I didn't see it. This was on like Babylon B or something. It was like, hey, there's good news and bad news. Good news is we get to worship Jesus before the throne um, for the rest of eternity. Bad news is the song is going to be Waymaker. <laughs> that is so good. Uh, <laughs> I I think you kind of, what you did there, Eric, once again, as a master communicator, is you were critical without being unkind, but then you just wrapped it all up in a great joke that basically explains everything you're trying to uh, uh, to share. And I want to share. <laughs> I, I want to. I want to add to your story. Um. Oh, first I'm gonna fix my light here because you know uh, we're gonna. Uh, well, there's no joke there. Just have to fix my light. Um. 
I remember a moment where Bethel came to New York City. I love Bethel. Super thankful for him. Um, they, they found a venue in Harlem to play at. Thousands of people show up. I arrive. I text you. And I say, hey, are you here? And you go, yeah. I was like, where are you at? You go, meet me. You said, meet me at the steps. I'm in the VIP section. And I think you immediately texted me right after that. I, I don't ask. I hate it too. Something like that. And listen, you know, artists go and do their art. They need a place to not get mobbed. I get it. No judgment there whatsoever. This is not the point of the story. You and I are standing in a balcony looking over the crowd that is singing. I might actually even bleep out who was playing because I don't want to be offensive, just like you were trying to not be critical or whatever. And we're standing by a friend of ours. Now, our friend is 6'3". I'm not going to say who it was. And at the end of this worship set, which was beautiful and people were crying out to God. It was like the church coming together from, you know, there's Baptists there and Catholics there and evangelicals there and Pentecostals there and Bethel's there. And at the end, they did have a small, please buy our stuff pitch. And you and I are standing there just going, okay, this happens. And beside us, on the balcony, over a crowd of thousands, our friend yells in a very quiet moment at the top of his lungs, we are not a market. And you and I are standing there just going. Oh my goodness. So I think <laughs> so while you and I are trying to. Like, now I'm remembering. Yeah. So you're good. So you and I are having this like, let's not be critical. This is a this is a space where there's tension. And then our friend, not a worship leader, loves Jesus, not, doesn't yeah. even work at a church, just yells out, we are not a market. There was no response or visceral reaction. But you and I were just, I remember us standing there being like, what do we do now? Let's, <laughs> let's go ahead. Well, I guess we'll exit the VIP section to start with. Um, that's, that's probably, anyway, I really appreciate you. I really appreciate you oh, yeah. sharing your thoughts there because, um, you do have a unique perspective. And I think, I think what you're sharing makes a lot of sense and it's a tough, I mean, this is a podcast. I jokingly said, uh, 30 minutes ago that a dozen people will listen. I hope this generates something. I, I hope this is encouraging. I hope people want to put ads on a piece of content I create. But it is an in, it's a strange tension when business, Jesus, and the church all start somewhat working together, um, as summed up by the Reverend Bono, uh, as you said yeah. earlier. So I think I thank you for your perspective. Um, I thank you for all of that and. Before we like kind of, you know, I, I don't want to leave without also just kind of getting into the fact that you don't just do prayer music. You write some, you have written some of my favorite rock songs of all time. So you, you have this world you live in called Young Oceans, but you also have Last Royals. Mm -hmm. Tell us about Last Royals, but also tell us like, Maybe this isn't a long answer, but how do you live in both of those worlds, live with both of those projects? Yeah, the Lost Royals was the thing that I was chipping away at. It was like the latest iteration of, of the type of music that I've been doing since I was in college, which is just indie rock or whatever, you know, back to our genre thing. Can I say something about that real quick? Yeah. Well, you, I, I, I forgot. I wanted to mention when you were talking about genres – um, I totally resonate with you because like, as you know, I've always been into metal. I love metal music. Yeah. My Sunday is filled with how great is our God or, um, Oh, come to the altar. But then on my way home in my headphones, I'm literally listening to a genre called death core. Um, and w when you talk to a metal head, 
there's a guy that lives in my building who's an old dad like me, and he we we both found out we like metal and we go to metal shows together. And if you ask him what band is this, he's like, well, they're technically grindcore with a little bit of metalcore mixed in. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, there's also, uh, some hints of black metal as well. And, uh, uh, and, <laughs> and, and when, the, you know, in, in, in their earlier stuff, there was way more power metal and I'm just like, great. So genres are a real thing. It's funny oh, how awesome. the rest of the world has gotten that. And we have worship. Interesting. But yeah, talk Thank to us you. about, the point. yeah, yeah. T t talk to me about, um, last Royals, young oceans, H how do they work together? If they do it all, how do you. How do you balance between the two projects? Does one get favor over the other? How does that all work for you? <laughs> yeah, one gets favor over the other because one is completely unsuccessful and one and one is not. Um, the Last Royals was a band that you know, like so many bands, like it just it just didn't take. You know, <laughs> it didn't take like the shower, like Georgia Shower. There, we got our Seinfeld reference. I got it. Yep, <laughs> and. Um, we, I, I mean, I, it's what I was pursuing for since I was, you know, essentially in my early 20s. And we worked really hard. We were signed on a label in Brooklyn and we got to do lots of cool stuff. And we had a song that, um, that got on to some radio stations and, and got a lot of love. And that was, it was a lot of fun. Um, the, I mean, the way it kind of works is like, I, I honestly don't like, I know that there's a difference, but like I work hard to not differentiate between what like like a true song. Like a like my pursuit with with Lost The Last Royals, which is, you know, an in just an indie rock band, was still the same thing I would have with Young Oceans, which is like, am I writing really honest music? Um, you know, whether the song the poetry is oriented to another person or whether it's a fictional story, you know, which often like a lot of my the last royal stuff was just kind of cultural satire which is a lot of fun um it still has to be true and it still has to like be, like feel honest you know on, on most levels so like um that's one way that, that the two projects like are always intersecting is like i have to i have to really believe it um now ways that they they they've really come to be different is like i said the last Royals was kind of a dead and dormant project. You know, we, we parted ways with the label. I tried to make it, I made a second record, which I really like love. And I was very proud of, and it just got no attention at all, which is just so often what happens. And then I was convinced that that project was totally dead. Um, but just really a year ago, actually for the last three years, I've been chipping away at, at, all, at a new batch of like pop songs um and and decided to make another last royals record which just came out like a month ago um but where that sits in my life right now is um it's it's honestly i just kind of it's it's totally hopefully a way to like make some money <laughs> because because like i i ended up putting it out with a sync company and um to try to get some some placements in film and TV. And we've already amazingly got a few things in some TV shows, so that's really great. Um, but so that's kind of the dumb kind of like business part of it. But um, there's a there's a more important part, which is like it's it can be really difficult to live in in very serious prayer music to be only focusing on that day in and day out um you know there's a there's a wonderful i think it's proverbs says do not be overly holy which i'm often convicted of because um i don't know if you find this like you know in a time of fasting or something like i can so easily um kind of without realizing it find myself find that i'm kind of elevating myself over even my own family you know because i have because like in in my kind of sort of like secret false holiness you know um, and when I kind of let that go, when I just sort of like stop taking myself so seriously is when I, I'm a much better dad and husband. Um, so as much as like, I would love to be like a, like a monkish, like a, like a, a really focused, you know, samurai prayer monk, 
I quickly get get um, kind of filled with pride when I head too much in that direction. Um, so yeah, doing like fun, sometimes silly, irreverent, like rock and roll, um, I think oddly enough helps me to do the prayer music in a much purer form. That's, that's interesting to me. Um, and I, and I would like you to, if you could expand just a little bit, I think you just summed it up in that last sentence. Speaking of silly, influential, earth shattering rock and roll. Can you talk to us about uh, Beyond Thunderdome or Live from the Thunderdome? No, no, it's Live from the Enormo Dome. Enormo. You're close. This, this is way too inside of a joke, but one of the best songs you ever wrote. <laughs> one of the best songs you ever wrote was with a band that no one will ever hear. But you sent me the album laughing. No, I didn't write that stuff, dude. I didn't write that stuff. I was only the drummer. No, you weren't just the drummer. You guys would switch positions, you told me. No, no. But we would. So I was in a band in college. (laughs) And we we were actually like really, um, we were really motivated. We would would go play these bar sets um, throughout the week or other week, play several times a week at bars. And we had a girl lead singer. I was the electric guitar player, and we we're four piece. And um, in order to play these bar sets, we had to learn all these cover songs because we only had like ten originals. I'm trying to write more and more, um, but we would learn all these covers so that we could do like these three hour sets and get paid. That was how we would fund our recordings. We would just play bars. Um, it was a great way to learn. And um, one. Our our drummer was was one of the was actually the main songwriter in the band at the time, and he was a really good songwriter. And he he had this whole set of like joke songs, basically like they sounded like ACDC. They were just like these really brutal, straight ahead like rock, like killer rock songs. And he would do that that scream falsetto thing, like the Bon Scott thing, or like and, a, like a, like the darkness. Yeah, it sounded exa- it was actually like pre dark before the darkness came along and when we saw them come out we're like oh, we totally should have done this, you know. But the gag was like we would let our singer take a break to rest her voice and the bass player would play guitar and he was like this really shreddy. He was a much better guitar player than I was. Our drummer would come and play bass and sing and I would play drums and we were called we called ourselves Brody. Um and because we we just had way too much time on our hands, we decided to make an EP at one point, and of course, no one ever heard it. This is like ah, this is so long ago. Um, but one day, just as a joke, like long after the, every that band had folded, I was living in New York. I I dug up the old recordings and like spliced like like spliced in all these like stadium sounds of like people screaming <laughs> and and like remastered the record like to make it so- and it's, it actually sounds incredible like it sounds like the best rock band you've ever heard playing to 30,000 people and oh. that must have been what I sent to you oh yeah and as you know you know my favorite track on the album I think it's called Six Pack yeah and uh I- I mean, we should just like fade in six pack right here. Uh, Where the chorus is literally uh lead lead singer one two three four five whole band six pack and when you sent that to me (laughs) i probably played it 30 times and the thing is now i'll every once in a while as you know eric i'll just text you one two three four five and you'll respond two days later six pack it's the best it's the best (laughs) um well, like it's Incredible. it's so funny. It's so funny. I think we kind of like went back in time, uh, like talking about you know, kind of like here's where you're at, and kind of like the journey from uh, uh, 
last Royals Young Oceans all the way back to our early, you know, like New York worship leading days and even before that in college. And before we leave, I just want to say, like, if you have not like if you know, um, if you're listening and you know, Eric, as the Young Oceans, um, uh, great. You need to listen to the last Royals. Um some of my favorites, I, I pulled it up here because I actually uh, was listening to it last night, um, just being like, oh, yeah, I remember this song. I remember the song. And this morning, um, my two and a half year old got a hold of the Google Home and was playing your songs. Um, Amazing. Only the Brave is one of the best songs ever written. Um, and then, I mean, like, dude, it's it's stupid. Also, the album yeah. name uh twistification from 2013 mm-hmm. that's also a joke from a friend of ours um mm-hmm. but uh i love um i i love it's a tie between um uh only the brave and good day radio <laughs> that's those are just those are just bangers and then i do want to bring this up um you have a song on there called uh i hate california we don't have to get into it <laughs> But my favorite Eric Marshall Last Royals story is I'm watching you play for the first time ever uh, with Last Royals. I think you were called something else at that point, but you're playing and everybody's into it. And all of a sudden you just go, you know, boom, boom, you're tuning and you go, hey, uh, anybody here from California? Half the crowd. <laughs> yeah, California. And you go, welcome, you guys. This song's called I Hate California. Boom, 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 boom. Right into it. It was it was beautiful. But if you haven't listened to Last Rails, you've got to. If you if you haven't heard Eric at all, Young Oceans uh is honestly some of the best, as you would say, prayer music, as we would say, prayer music out there. Um, and Last Rails is incredible. Some of my like one of my if you're gonna start for me, if you're gonna start listening to Young Oceans, I'd actually love to hear your take on this. I would start with the track. It's actually the first. I think it's your most played track um, until these tears are gone is just one of the most well-written, most well-written prayer songs ever aside from, and I'm going to go to a deep cut here. It's tied with me. uh, Oh, darkest night. And I don't know if you've ever done that as a young ocean song, but you, but you did write it. It's on the first if, record. Is it? Okay. So yeah. if you were if if you were talking if you were talking to someone and they were going to ask like where should I start? What's if you were if someone said what does your music sound like? What would you play them? What song? Uh, Young Oceans. Oh man. Yeah, it's that that's like an impossible. I don't know. I'm I'm always a fan of whatever the latest thing is, you sure. know, and I was like in the early stuff was like, "Oh, what was I thinking?" Um, I, I, this, the album, you are fullness, which came out like two or three years ago is, is probably something I'm most proud of at this moment. I would start there. That's awesome. Um, I want to ask you one more question before we get out of here. Um, actually, yeah. I, I feel like I keep going back to like old school, you and me stories and then asking questions. And I'm going to share one more. I want to talk to you about relationship dynamics between church staff members because you and I mastered it. <laughs> you... <laughs> You, true. you have to remember this. You and I and two other worship pastors were, were on staff at a large church network for New York City, very large, few thousand people, bunch of different churches, twelve or thirteen different churches. And when these worship pastors would get together and talk, there was often disagreement, there was often subtle argument, and we came up with a system when someone said something truly offensive, do you remember the system? <laughs> Rebuked. Yes. You would, if someone hurt someone else's feelings, they would look at, they would look at that person and go rebuked. And the other person would just say received. And that was the end of it. Except for, except for one time, there was one time where I, where I think it was you, someone looked at you and said rebuked. And you said, not received and the argument continued and eventually got worked out (laughs) i loved it we have mastered relationship dynamics uh that's the that's the end of that story i wanted to ask you one last question because you kind of hinted at it earlier i want to talk about songwriting really quickly and creativity 
I feel like we've kind of gone back and forth on some things that have happened in the Christian worship, prayer, music industry, some things that have happened in CCM, some things that have happened in the church. And one thing I'm noticing more and more is that worship leaders, worship pastors are often almost expected to be good songwriters. Mm. I am not a good songwriter. You know what I'm good at? I'm a good collaborator. If you sit me in a room for 12 months, I'll come up with something. It's not going to be phenomenal. If you put me in a room with three or four pretty good songwriters, I will contribute. That's something I've learned about myself. Maybe not in years past, but in recent years, I've learned that. As a matter of fact, one of your, I think it's until these tears are gone. I don't, I'm going to remember the song later. You actually brought me one of your songs and said, what would you do with this melody wise? And I remember singing something to you and you going, hmm, and walking away with it. And what you came up with was so different than what I suggested. And obviously it was it was, was sung by our church. No, it was sung by our church for years. And I had, I was never, I wasn't like, oh, I really remember thinking in the back of my mind, that is way better than what I said. Way better, guys. Way better. <laughs> but I think there's like this, like all kidding aside, there is this like almost expectation that when you become a worship pastor, you're supposed to write worship or prayer or CCM music. And I see it happen mm -hmm. over and over again where I'll sit in meetings. And uh, a pastor will look across, you know, the table or the room at me or something and say, hey, what about writing? Can we write some stuff? And I kind of find myself looking around going, I never told you I was a songwriter. And I don't blame them for that. I think it's a culture that's been created. But you are a songwriter. Like, when you hear that, like, what's your take on that? Like, what are your feelings about that? Because I see it happening over and over. But I feel like I'm the, not to pump myself up, I just haven't heard anybody else talk about it where I'm like, mm. Actually, I think song songs should be written by songwriters, and I don't think everyone is one. Mm. And thanks for sharing. Um, well, first of all, I had literally just last week a friend from down here in Nashville texted me about that chorus that you wrote. Dwell in me, dwell so richly in me for Be Thou My Vision. And he was like, dude, did you write that? We sing that all the time at our church. I was like, no, I didn't write that. My friend Patrick Murphy wrote that one. So I think you have more. I think you got more instinct than you, than you give yourself credit for. This keeps coming back. Nice Thank part. you. This keeps coming back up. I said to our buddy Alf once, he said, this is so good, uh, th those words. I said, dude, all I wrote was five words. Dwell in me so richly. Yeah. And he said, dude, they were the right five words. And maybe that's what it's that's about. So I, I appreciate well, that encouragement. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, please take it because, you know, like I, well, I, I have like, first thought is like, I'll just give you my long answer. Okay. Yeah. This is my, and, 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 and edit it later if you hate it. <laughs> um, I, I have this, this theory that, um, Okay, maybe one day I'll go to school and get this stuff all squared away and get it get the timeline right. But like when the West, <laughs> the America, America um, basically s split off from um, sort of mainstream, uh, obviously it was Anglicanism, then at the beginning of the New World was was what eventually became Episcopalianism. There was Puritanism from New England. Um, but eventually America became largely what we now call an uh, evangelical, all these splintered denominations. Um, we, like America, one of the things that it does very well to its own detriment is is find sort of like market silos it finds ways to like um like make things work in its own way and and in in america we have basically over the last 200 years not not the catholics not necessarily the episcopalians and and maybe not the lutherans or presbyterians 
but many of our denominations have have effectively thrown out um, what is collectively known as the liturgy. I don't know if Gunger got into any of this with you, but he and I used to talk about this all the time. And, you know, this is something that, that, that men and women have been honing since the early church is how do we, how do we pray together? How do we gather together? What is, what is the substance of our gathering? You know, what are the things that we're doing and saying and, and, and singing? Um, and the Catholic church, of course, as you know, came up with this concept of like, of, of liturgy and, and sacraments, you know what I mean? The, 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 the highest sacrament, of course, being communion, Eucharist, the table. Um, and and there's many traditions that still will hold that sacramental focus as the sort of um, the template for their worship. After all, that's what Jesus said to do. Whenever you gather, like or Paul, like like don't. Um, don't neglect this thing. I'm giving you this meal and do it every time you get together. You know what I mean? Like, so it's, it's pretty, it's pretty literal. I'm not sure how it turned into like once a month, you know what I mean? Um, in, in you know, the Baptist. Um, now where I'm going with this is this. When you throw out sacramental focus, something will become a sacrament. It's sort of like, it's sort of like, um, you know, I grew up in in a in a culture where a lot of my family were Baptist, and they wouldn't touch a drink. No, we were not. No alcohol. Wouldn't touch it. Um, you know, but we'll have dessert after every meal. You know what I mean? Like we'll have pie and cake and ice. It's like for some reason there's something in our humanness where, like, when we when we say no to something. We're just like, but we're all about this over here. Like we, like we, we will always fill gaps with something. And I believe that one of the gaps, like in throwing out largely a sacramental and liturgical template, um, which is just a template, we filled in gaps with other things that have become de facto sacraments. And I believe the main de facto sacrament in our culture right now is this this behemoth that we call worship music. And we 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 effectively tell our culture, our people, our kids, that when you crank the music in just the right way and you play the four chord, ooh, and the six minor, and 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 there's the girl who's swaying and she's got the hat and the lights are right, that's when the spirit shows up. That's the only time the Holy Spirit shows up. And you got to get those things right. So I would ask the question, obviously I'm being a jerk, um, but I would, ask, I would ask the question, how is this any different from what we, from the classic kind of um, um, uh, stereotypical mockery of, old school Catholicism with all, all that mumbo jumbo and smells and bells and you know and they say things over there like how is that really any different like like we we kind of like conjure up these moments um and ultimately it all has to do with like we do desire God we do desire a touch with our maker you know what I mean and but what I think has happened is that music has become this, this, this like Frankenstein in our culture, um, and it's overtaken us. And so when a pastor says, "Well, we should be writing too," all he's doing is responding to this to this pressure of our culture, which is that's where the action is, that's where the spirit shows up, and you, you have more of God if you're tapped into that template. And and where and where I'll finish and I'm getting fired up, is that I, I I don't think that God will ever be mocked with any of this. I think that you could be a lifelong Catholic, and if you've and if you've in spirit and truth received the Eucharist in a worshipful and humble manner, I think God will meet you there. 
I also think that if you've been a lifelong Catholic or Episcopalian and you've been doing it just out of rote necessity, you probably won't feel that touch from God. You know what I mean? And the same is true for any of our de, de facto sacraments. It's all about our heart. It's all about our posture. We can cue um, all of the worship leaders throwing away their hats. Um, no, I... Yeah, let's lose the hat. Yeah, um, it's so funny how, as a song cues up downstairs, uh, it's so funny. This might be a little controversial, but if I listened to what you just said and it made me angry, a little fiery, which it didn't, like, I think that's more of a, I need to check some stuff inside of me. It's like, what did, what did Eric say? Like, Eric said, let's not get whipped up into a frenzy. Let's go back to the, that's an okay thing. As long as we're remembering the foundations, the basics, why yeah. would that make any, why would that make anyone angry? Um, have you, right. ever, have you ever heard of the author Harold uh, Best? No, don't know the name. Wrote, it, it, listen to, remember what you just said and listen to this quote from him. He wrote this book called Unceasing Worship. And I've often viewed this quote as like relating to like, you need to let go of like your worship preferences. Mm. But listen, but listen to what he says. It's kind of a long quote, but, but I'll do it quick. If in making music or listening to it, I assume that faith will bring substance and evidence to the music so as to make it more worshipful, I'm getting into real trouble. If I truly love the music, that is, if I've chosen a church that uses my music and I'm deeply moved by it, I can make the mistake of coupling faith to musical experience by assuming that the power and effectiveness of music is what brings substance and evidence to my faith. I can then quite I can then quite easily forge a connection between the power of the music and the nearness of the Lord. Once this happens, I may even slip fully into the sin of equating the power of the music and the nearness of the Lord. At this point, the music joins the bread and the wine in the creation of a new sacrament. Or let's just say, I deeply love Jesus, but I detest the music. It's not my music. What am I then to do in the absence of a linkage between having faith and loving music? Where is God in all of this? If he's in the music, I'll never find him. Because to me, there's no substance or evidence, even though others seemingly find him there. Do I wait for the right kind of music so that my faith, faith becomes effectual? Do I look for another church, hoping that my faith will be fed and my felt needs met? Or do I... Or do I turn from the music to the Lord, knowing that the, that faith remains faith and music is merely music and not a sacramental substance that mediates between God and me? I hope that last question becomes the only question. Otherwise, faith needs exterior scaffolding for worship to become authentic worship. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to send did that. You just have that like, did you have yeah. that like at the ready? No, when you That's were talking, insane. when you were talking, I began, uh, I, that was, uh, th these are, these are teaching notes from a teaching I did called Incredible. a lifestyle of worship. And it's a great book. He has this uh, oh book goodness. called unceasing worship. Um, that is, is it him? Uh, yeah. Unceasing worship. I, it's a book I suggest for every worship leader out there. Um, I have no relation to this guy. I've never met him. I've never heard him teach. I've just read a few of his things. And it's it's literally what you're saying. It's literally what you're saying. So it's I'm so stunned. Funny. I've never heard anyone articulate that so well. I, I've I'll been like bouncing this idea around and, and like he nailed it. Yeah, maybe I'll send it to David too, uh, because yeah, you're right. He did kind of uh, 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 dabble into this area as well. But it's so funny how I was asking a simple question not a simple question, but a, a question just kind of about my personal felt experience of like, you know, I've gone through some times where a, a pastor who was my boss looked at me and said, we're, we're cutting your salary because you're not an artist enough. And me looking mm -hmm. back going, I never said I was, I was hired to lead worship. Like what? So obviously there's some, like some of my own trauma built up in that statement, but you, you address that while also talking about the deeper issue of, I guess trying to be trendy or keep up and and you explained it so so well. I mean along with that quote which is exactly what you said 
You explained it so well, and you have you do have a unique perspective, Eric. Like you have been someone who I've watched live that out while also being in the world where you work with worship artists. You write worship music that people play in churches. You uh, produce this prayer uh, music, as you call it. And I just think it's a it's a unique perspective, of, and I'm super thankful um, uh, that you shared it. And I've, I've actually been waiting for this interview, both, both you and David as songwriters and uh, current or former or worship pastors of some kind. I've wanted to ask you that question, and you did not let me down um, on the answer. But before we get out of here, um, hey, where, I know we mentioned several projects you're working on. Where do you want people uh, to find you? How can they listen to your stuff? Uh, what's your preferred way for people to get in touch with you, et cetera? The marketing. Hey, man, I'm not a market, bro. Don't. Yeah, it's not a market. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> It's all out there. Um, I I yeah, love, dude. Okay. I love you so much. I love you so much. You are, you choose to be bad at this, and it make it makes me. It brings me so much joy. If you okay, what here's I'll answer this question for you. What everybody needs to do is find Young Oceans on Instagram and just scroll, scroll until you see a, a post that Eric was clearly told to do. That is an ad <laughs> for his music yeah. because what Eric does, what you do is you will open your phone and it will start with some phrase like this. Hey, I hate the internet. Um, I hate, uh, I got it. You know, me album, <laughs> uh, my album's coming out. And then around <laughs> the whole thing, it just says ad like flashing gifs that just say ad and it's the best thing ever and you've literally said yeah. on those posts before i hate this <laughs> yeah this is an advertisement yeah i was on a kick for a minute like labeling every time this is an ad um yeah i yeah i, I get it no please listen to the music um i i at this point i'm like you listen to the music helps helps us make more music so that's cool yeah. um i actually would love for people to check out the new last royal stuff because um worked really hard on it and i'm really proud of those songs that'd be fun thanks for bringing that up um it's all out there on everything and and instagram and such instagram and friendster uh friendster. zenga myspace um all, <laughs> zenga all, all the hits um hey listen man thank you so much for chatting with us because uh, not only are you someone i consider to be just such a good old friend but the perspective you shared today about some of the things we talked about are just uh, are lessons that, you know, uh, I hope to be able to pass on to future worship leading generations. Thanks so much for chatting with us, man. Love you, man. Thanks for uh, wonderful questions. Grateful for you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Links to everything you need can be found in the description. And as always, if you need to get a hold of us, you can shoot us an email at theundignifiedworship at gmail.com or follow us on Instagram at This Is Undignified Worship. We'll see you next time.